Oh, welcome back to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda. This episode, we're continuing our series on biblical list. You know, this is really the backbone, the core of the historical case for the Protestant canon in popular form and also sometimes even in scholarly form. And often you'll encounter simply names like Melito and Origen and Athanasius and, of course, Cyril of Jerusalem. Uh, sometimes they'll give you a list but almost never will they look at usage, and there's a very good reason why. So we're going to continue our series. We're going to look at Cyril of Jerusalem and his catechetical lectures and see what he has to say in regards to the Old Testament canon. So strap in your seatbelts, folks, because the apocalypse is about to begin. Okay, so let's dive into Cyril of Jerusalem, and it's really important if you haven't checked out the last two videos we did with Athanasius of Alexandria, you definitely need to review that because Athanasius has often said that he rejected the Deuterocanon because he didn't include it amongst uh, this category called those that are canonized. But what's often missed is that Athanasius is actually using a threefold division within religious literature. And the fact that he put the Deuterocanon, except for Baruch, in the middle category doesn't show a rejection, but rather it shows that he's making a distinction between the books that can be used to evangelize godly teaching and those that are to be used in-house for catechesis and uh, Christian doctrine. And of course, that fits perfectly with how he uses these books everywhere else. We have a similar thing going on here with Cyril of Jerusalem, and we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll go through the list in a second. But like Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem also uses the Deuterocanon in a way that is completely compatible with the Protocanon. In fact, he often cites the Deuterocanon and the Protocanon together with no distinction or qualification. He uses it in some very important ways. And although the surviving documents we have from Cyril of Jerusalem is much, much smaller than what we have from Athanasius. Nevertheless, the little bit that we get shows that he too accepted these books. In fact, he adduces them in the very catechetical lectures that he produces this list. And that brings up that tension that I mentioned in the introduction that uh, for Protestants who want to take this list in isolation, and claim that he's making only these books are inspired scripture, only these books are canonical scripture, and everything else is excluded or rejected, that causes a big problem. Because how could he reject these books as apocrypha and yet use those very same books for instruction for catechumens? Well, let's go into it. And the best place to start would be to go to the fourth catechetical lecture. And let's read some of the surrounding context and look at Cyril Jerusalem's list, shall we? All right. Okay, starting in paragraph 33, it says, quote, the teaching you have heard is that of divinely inspired scriptures, both of the Old and the New Testament. For there is one God of the two Testaments who foretold in the Old Testament the Christ who appeared in the New, and who, through the preparatory school of the Law and the Prophets, led us to Christ. For before faith came, we were guarded under the Law, and the Law trained us for Christ's school. And so, if ever you hear any heretic blaspheming the Law and the Prophets, Quote that saving word against them. Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Be eager to learn, and from the church, what are the books of the Old Testament, what of the new, and I pray you, read none of the apocryphal books. For why should you, when you do not know the books acknowledged by all, trouble yourself needlessly with those whose authenticity is disputed? Read the divine scriptures, these 22 books of the Old Testament, translated by the 72 interpreters. 
This, of course, is a reference to the Greek Septuagint, which is a pre-Christian Jewish translation of the Old Testament. And it's also the primary text that the New Testament draws from. And it's also the text that the church in the East used as its scripture. And in paragraph 34, Cyril of Jerusalem goes into some of the legendary accounts of the miraculous translation of the Greek Septuagint. And then in paragraph 35, he begins his list by saying, Of oh, these, read 22 books and have nothing to do with the apocryphal writings. Study earnestly only those books which we read openly in church. For far wiser and more devout than yourself were the apostles and the ancient bishops, the rulers of the church, who handed down these books. Therefore, since you are a child of the church, do not transgress her ordinances. Of the Old Testament, then, it has been said, study these 22 books, and if you are eager to learn, strive to fix them by name in your memory as I enumerate them. For the law of the books of Moses are the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then he continues to list the proto-canon up to Jeremiah, where he says, of Jeremiah, with Baruch, the Lamentations, and the Epistle, one, the Ezekiel, and the book of Daniel, the 22nd of the Old Testament. Of the New Testament, there are only four Gospels, for the rest are not genuine and are harmful. The Manichaeans, who also wrote a Gospel according to Thomas, which through the spurious odor of sanctity conferred by its title, corrupts simple folk, received the Acts of the Apostles, in addition, the seven Catholic epistles of James, Peter, John, and Jude, then as a seal upon all of them, and the last work of the disciples, the 14 epistles of St. Paul. But let all the rest be put in the second. And whatever books are not read in the churches, read not by yourself in accordance with what you have been told thus far concerning these matters, unquote. So as you can see here, Cyril of Jerusalem's list has a lot of affinity with Athanasius' list. First and most important, Cyril of Jerusalem does not use the same modern binary that we do today in terms of religious literature. For us, something is either inspired or it's not inspired, it's canonical or it's apocrypha. So there's only two possible categories. If it's one, then it's not the other, and if it's the other, it's not the one. However, like we saw with Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem here is dividing religious literature into three categories. Cyril does something similar here. The first category appears to be the 22 books, and these are the ones that the catechumen are to study and accept. Then there are those that are read in the churches, which is kind of an interesting phrase. We saw something similar to that in uh, Origin of Alexandria's Letter to Africanus, where he talks about how the Deuterocanon is read in all the churches of Christ. So you have a wider category of the books that are read, but were not part of the 22. And then you have the third category of the Apocrypha, which Cyril says that the catechumens are not to read. So just like with Athanasius, the fact that he doesn't list the Deuterocanon amongst the 22 books for these catechumen doesn't mean that he rejects these books as not being inspired and not being canonical. Rather, they make up this middle category of the books that are read in the churches, and the catechumen are allowed to read it. Now, the very fact that Cyril of Jerusalem uses the Deuterocanon in these very same lectures shows that he did not include them among the Apocrypha. And since they're not listed amongst the 22 books that he explicitly lists, except for Baruch, um, therefore they fit within the books that are read in the churches that the catechumens are supposed to read. But as he says, he should, they should put them in second rank. The first rank should be the 22. Now, someone may say, ah, we'll see, that shows the superiority of the 22 books. But why does he single out the 22 books? That's really the next question. Now, instead of somebody posing their own point of view on Cyril of Jerusalem, like saying that they're superior, that somehow they're 
truly scripture or something like that. We need to let Cyril of Jerusalem speak for himself and tell us exactly why does he single these books out for these brand new Christians to read. And we're very fortunate that we don't have to guess what Cyril meant and why he makes this distinction, because he already tells us at the very beginning of the catechetical lectures. In the portion of the lectures, the very first part, which is called the pro-catechesis, in paragraph 10, he says, be faithful in your attendance of the catechizing. Even though we protract our discourse, do not let your mind yield to distraction. You are taking up arms against the enemy. You are taking up arms against heretics, against the Jews, against the Samaritans, against the Gentiles. Your enemies are many. Take plenty of ammunition. You have targets in plenty. You must learn how to shoot down the Greeks and do battle with the heretic, Jew, and Samaritan. Your weapons are sharp, and the sharpest of all is the sword of the Spirit. But your right hand must strike with holy resolution to fight the fight of the Lord if you would conquer the opposing powers and make yourself proof against every stratagem of heresy. The quote, the sword of the spirit, comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, where Paul says that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. So in these conflicts, where they are to shoot down the arguments of those who oppose them, which includes the Jews, Obviously, the word of God that they use to oppose the Jews must be books that are accepted by Jews. And we have already seen this with, for example, Melito of Sardis, where Melito is requested to give a list of books so that he can give proof texts to be used to evangelize the Jews. And he lists the proto-canonical books minus Esther. We've also seen the same thing with Athanasius of Alexandria, where he places in the canonical list those books that can be used for evangelizing the Jews effectively because those are the books that Christians and Jews both mutually accept as divine scripture. So if the sword of the Spirit's the word of God and they are going to use them as weapons against the Jews, obviously the books that the catechumens will need to know and know very thoroughly are those books that the Jews accept as divine scripture. It's enough here to see that Cyril Jerusalem's lectures aren't just merely giving a discourse on doctrine, but rather it's a pastoral concern. Because why? Because Cyril of Jerusalem is from Jerusalem. And the chief critic of Christians in Jerusalem at this time were the Jews. These catechumens were going to encounter Jewish objections, and so they needed to be forearmed not only against them, but also against heretics and other opposing groups as well. In fact, if you look closer at the context that we read earlier, you'll see how this apologetic purpose, this defensive purpose, is weaved within the list itself. For example, in paragraph 33, he adds, so if ever you hear any heretic blaspheming the law and the prophets, quote the saving word against them. Jesus came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So this is a basic defense strategy that he is instilling in the soon-to-be Christians, because they, if they encounter this, you give this proof text to them. The same is true later, where he says, of the New Testament, there are only four Gospels, for the rest are not genuine and are harmful. The Manichaeans also wrote the Gospel according to Thomas, but through the spurious order of sanctity conferred by its title, corrupts simple folks. So here he's calling out a heretical group known as the Manichaeans. They were a quasi-Christian group. They apparently manufactured the Gospel of Thomas, according to Cyril. And Cyril's saying, look, there's only four. So don't be fooled by this Gospel of Thomas. Again, the discussion is couched in apologetics against opposing groups. And indeed, in the very next section, he says the following. In 37, he says, Fall not into the sect of the Samaritans or into Judaism, for henceforth Jesus Christ has redeemed you. Stand aloof 
from all observation of Sabbaths and speak not of any of the indifferent meats as common or unclean, but abhor especially the assembly of the wicked heretics and in every way make your soul safe by fasting, prayer, alms, and the reading of the divine oracles. So as a good pastor and bishop, Cyril wishes these brand new Christians to be fortified in the very scripture that will be used against them by their Jewish opponents in religious controversies. But notice he doesn't exclude the books that are read in church. In fact, like I said, he uses them throughout his lectures. So it's no surprise, for example, that we find in Catechetic Lecture 1115, where Seal introduces a quote from the Deuterocanonical Book of Baruch as a prophecy. In fact, he introduces it as coming from the prophet. He also uses it in some very substantial ways elsewhere. For example, in Lecture 6-4, Cyril Jerusalem cites Sirach 3, 21 through 22, concerning the incomprehensibility of God. Even more important in lecture nine, he cites Wisdom 13, 5, that God can be known through nature. In fact, this is worth reading. He says, it is impossible then to perceive the divine nature with bodily eyes, but from his divine works, we may gain some impression of his power. According to the words of Solomon, quote, for from the greatness and the beauty of created things, the original author by analogy is seen. Then Cyril continues. Now he did not say that from created things, the creator is seen, but he added by analogy. For so much the greater does God seem to each man as man achieves a loftier concept of creatures. And when by deeper contemplation, he has elevated his heart, he gains a loftier concept of God. One thing to note, now Cyril doesn't get into this in the catechetical lecture, simply because this is a much more advanced concept. But what I think he's doing is he's using wisdom 13.5 to emphasize a point that if they encounter the Arians, they can use to their advantage. Because like we saw with Athanasius, in his controversies with the Arians, the Arians would use these paradigma, these illustrations from scripture to try to make it seem that the son is a creation of the father. And so they'll use things like begat or the word or breath or something like that. And they'll say that there was a time where the father was not with the son, then the son came and then, uh, so the son is not consubstantial with the father. Athanasius steps in and says, no, these, these illustrations, these paradigma in scripture are to be used as an analogy for God. God is of a totally different sort than anything that he creates. He's categorically different. And so you can't take these illustrations and make a one-to-one -one comparison with God. You have to see it as an analogy that God is far greater, but yet there is a sort of truth that's being expressed in both terms. Uh, I believe Cyril is essentially front-loading his catechesis with this idea when he points out and singles out, by the way, if you've noticed in, uh, in wisdom, that it's seen by analogy, and that is his main point. So you can see the deuterocanonical book of wisdom is being used here to carry some authoritative weight, like a divine revelatory text by Cyril of Jerusalem. And likewise, he cites the very same text, Wisdom 13.5 in Lecture 10.16. He also quotes Wisdom in Lecture 12.5 to explain that it's through the envy of the devil that sin entered into the world. He uses Wisdom again in Lecture 16.19, show that God is more powerful than the devil. And as I mentioned in the introduction in lecture 13.8, he quotes Sirach 4.31 along with James 1.5. Now notice here that he quotes these two texts one after the other with absolutely no distinction or qualification, which signals that perhaps he didn't 
distinguish or qualify either text, certainly not in terms of their authority. So I think when you put all the evidence together, it's very clear that the list that he gives in lecture four is not meant to mean that only the 22 books are scripture, or even that they're superior to the other books, but rather this is a pastoral concern so that these brand new Christians, when they encounter opposition by the Jews, that they'll be thoroughly studied in the books that the Jews use and be able to, as Cyril says, do battle, shoot down their arguments. And to point out this list as somehow proof that the early church restricted the scriptures down to the proto-canonical books, I think is totally missing the point. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and God willing, we'll be back again soon. Do another one. Bye-bye, everybody.